Today we're going to talk a little bit about some coastal geology. Whenever you're at the beach or driving along the coastline, there's so many interesting features that have molded the coast to what you see. So today we're going to explore some of those things, how they're formed, and some of the names we give to those features. So come on, let's enjoy this coast. The shoreline is a really dynamic place. You can think of it as a battle between deposition and erosion, where erosion will be destroying the coast, either through waves or wind, sea level rise, or human interference. Deposition, on the other hand, will be creating new coast through earthquake uplift, lava flows, river deposits, tsunami deposits, or even human influence as well. So let's take a look at some of the things that are reflected by a high or low energy coast. The amount of energy hitting our shorelines will determine the presence and types of sediments. You can have a high energy coast with very little sediment available or a low energy coast with a lot of sand and sediment creating our beautiful beaches. So if you see a big broad beach, it's probably going to be due to low energy where the beach slope is less than 5 degrees and the sand is very fine grained. The rocky beach, on the other hand, will reflect high energy erosion with a slope that is more than 5 degrees and the presence of very little sand. Most likely you'll see rocks and pebbles. Coastal erosion usually starts with the chemical and physical breakdown of exposed rock by wind and waves. There's a real chemical reaction going on in the cracks and minerals. Now sea glass is a great example of how ocean water can erode a surface over time through abrasion. And abrasion is really just like sandblasting. It's the process by which fine particles in the seawater are constantly scuffing and roughing up the surface of a material. And through all the tumbling the sea glass does in the surf, you're going to see more rounded pieces of glass with less transparency. Some of the more prominent features that we see in an erosional coast include sea cliffs. Essentially it's a steep cliff that's been eroded by waves and wind with big chunks of rock that calve off and break off into the surf leaving behind a steep wall. Another feature we might see is a sea cave. This is just an opening in the coastal rocks or cliff that's caused by wave and wind erosion usually in rocks that are faulted or weaker than the surrounding rock or material. Now some sea caves can work their way into a vertical opening that we call a blowhole. This can allow water to escape as a spout when a wave comes bursting into the cave and it looks pretty similar to the spouting of a whale. Now it's not uncommon to see very large flat surfaces lying just under the surf we call them wave cut platforms and this is usually due to wave erosion removing all the sand right down to the rocky surface. The next feature we might observe on the coast is a sea arch. This is just an opening in the coastal rocks and is caused by wave and wind erosion and often these sea arches begin as sea caves. Eventually the arch will give way when it becomes too thin to support its own weight, and we call these remnant rocks a sea stack. An extreme example of coastal erosion is a fjord, like the ones we see in Norway or the Southern Alps of New Zealand. This is just a narrow inlet with steep sides that was carved out by glaciers and may have taken millions of years. Let's take a look at some of the features associated with depositional coasts. Whenever material is eroded from some place, it has to go somewhere. And so these deposits may or may not end up on the coast and contribute to the coastal geometry. How and where material gets deposited depends on two major things, longshore drift and longshore current. Drift is where waves come in at an angle, washing material onto the beach at that same angle and as the water flows back into the ocean perpendicular to the shoreline, 
beach sand is progressively moved down the coast in a zigzag pattern. Longshore currents flow parallel to the shore carrying sand and material that is caught up in the surf zone. This material is transported along the shoreline but remains offshore. However, when the shoreline depth becomes too shallow, the current will slow down and not be able to suspend its load. So we'll see fast moving water will suspend particles, but slow moving water cannot support the load. Therefore, it's not unusual to see a long sandbar or spit at the tip of a peninsula where the longshore current has trouble keeping up its speed as it rounds the bend. Another feature we see is a bay mouth bar which is a long sandbar extending between two endpoints at the mouth of a bay or estuary. Bay mouth bars form just like spits where longshore current loses speed and drops its load. The small islands that are near the shore can sometimes lead to a sandbar or a bridge between islands and the mainland and we call them tombolos. This is one more example of longshore current that enters a shallow area and dumps its sand. Finally, we can have deposition along submerged ridges or extensions of the mainland that go out into the ocean in the same way that a spit forms. Sometimes these long sandbars come to the surface in the form of barrier islands and so you often see a long string of these islands. The ocean side of these islands tends to be smooth and straight while the mainland side tends to be highly irregular and shallow. Well, that's all we have time for right now, so join us next time for more topics in coastline geology. I'm Mike Kozik, and this is your Science Class.